Introduction, Terry Sanford. James Terry Sanford. August the 20th, 1917, April the 18th, 1998. Was an American university administrator and politician from North Carolina. A member of the Democratic Party, Sanford was the 65th governor of North Carolina. 1961 to 1965. A two-time U.S. presidential candidate in the 1970s and a U.S. senator. 1986 to 1993. Sanford was a strong proponent of public education and introduced a number of reforms and new programs in North Carolina's schools and institutions of higher education as the state's governor, increasing funding for education and establishing the North Carolina Fund. From 1969 to 1985, Sanford was president of Duke University. An Eagle Scout as a youth, Sanford became an FBI agent after graduating from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1939. During World War II, he saw combat in the European theater and received a battlefield commission. Following his return to civilian life after World War II, Sanford attended and graduated from the University of North Carolina School of Law and began a legal career in the late 1940s, soon becoming involved in politics. A lifelong Democrat, he was noted for his progressive leadership in civil rights and education, although his opponents criticized him as a tax and spend liberal, Sanford is remembered as a major public figure of the South after World War II. Part 1, Early Life Sanford was born in 1917 in Laurenburg, North Carolina, the son of Elizabeth Harry Martin and Cecil Leroy Sanford, both of English descent. He became an Eagle Scout in Laurenburg's Troop 20 of the Boy Scouts of America. B.S. Shortly before he died, Sanford related his scouting experience to journalist David Gergen and said that it probably saved my life in the war. Boys who had been scouts or had been in the CCC knew how to look after themselves in the woods. What I learned in scouts sustained me all my life, it helped me make decisions about what was best. The BS recognized him with its Distinguished Eagle Scout Award. Sanford graduated from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1939 and then served as a special agent in the FBI for two years. He married Margaret Rose Knight on July 4, 1942, and they later had two children, Terry Jr. and Elizabeth. During World War II, he enlisted as a private in the U.S. Army and later attained the rank of first lieutenant. He parachuted into France with the 517th Parachute Infantry Regiment and subsequently fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He was awarded the Bronze Star and Purple Heart for his bravery and wounds, respectively. Sanford was honorably discharged in 1946. Sanford later served as a company commander with the rank of Captain in Company K of 119th Infantry Regiment of the North Carolina Army National Guard from 1948 to 1960. After the war, Sanford earned a law degree from the University of North Carolina School of Law and served as president of the Young Democratic Clubs of North Carolina, now known as the Young Democrats of North Carolina. Part 2, Gubernatorial Career Sanford was an assistant director of the Institute of Government of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill from 1946 until 1948, then began a private practice of law in Fayetteville. Sanford served one term as a state senator, 1953-55, and chose not to run for a second term. He ran for governor of North Carolina in 1960, defeating I. Beverly Lake, Sr., Malcolm Bowie Sewell, and John D. Larkins in the Democratic primary and Robert Gavin in the general election. Elected to a single term. As North Carolina governors could then be elected for only one term. Sanford served from January 1961 to January 1965. Part 2, Gubernatorial Career 
Chapter 1 Education In 1960, North Carolina spent $237 per pupil in public school, as opposed to New York's $562. Paid some of the lowest salaries in the country to its teachers, had overcrowded high school classes, and had the lowest average number of years of education among its residents in the United States. Sanford believed that improved statewide education would raise North Carolina's low average wages. In his inaugural address, he affirmed his wish to increase spending for the purpose, saying, if it takes more taxes to give our children this quality education, we must face that fact and provide the money. We must never lose sight of the fact that our children are our best investment. This is no age for the faint of heart. Sanford nearly doubled North Carolina's expenditures on public schools. He began consolidating the University of North Carolina system to ensure its solvency and strength and oversaw the creation of the North Carolina Community College system. He conceived the idea for the Governor's School of North Carolina, a publicly funded six-week residential summer program for gifted high school students in the state. He established the North Carolina School of the Arts, now University of North Carolina School of the Arts, to keep talented students in the fields of music, drama, the dance and allied performing arts at both the high school and college levels of instruction in their home state. The centerpiece of Sanford's education platform was the Quality Education Program, which called for a 22% increase in average teacher pay, 33% more funds for instructional supplies and a 100% increase in school library money. Sanford initially had difficulty figuring out how to fund his proposal, as the state already levied comparatively high income and corporate taxes, and a luxury tax on goods such as tobacco and soft drinks was likely to upset much of the populace. Many other elected state officials were fiscally conservative, and were likely to oppose any significant borrowing of money and raising debts. Thus, at the end of February 1961, Sanford decided to fund his proposals through the elimination of exemptions of the state's 3% sales tax on certain goods, including food and prescription drugs. The advanced taxes were controversial, and the conservative North Carolina General Assembly was hesitant to pass them into law. Upon the convening of the General Assembly in March many legislators commented in private that the proposal was doomed to fail. Liberals and journalists criticized it as unfair to the poor, who would be hurt the most by a tax on food. Sanford promoted his plan through a series of rallies across the state, one of which was broadcast on radio. He argued that North Carolina trailed most other states with respect to education and that the exemptions elimination was more acceptable than a 1% tax increase on all other items. He also intensively lobbied state legislators, inviting them to breakfast at the governor's mansion and visiting them at the Sir Walter Hotel, where most of them stayed while the General Assembly was in session. Aside from arguing for his program, Sanford conducted political favors in exchange for support. He also actively challenged his critics to think of a better way to fund the education plan. Members of the press and disgruntled liberals backed down when they realized that without the new levy the education expansions would have to be scaled down. His effort was ultimately successful and the General Assembly implemented his program and the taxes. The latter were poorly received in North Carolina and resulted in a backlash. In November 1961 the electorate rejected 10 state bond proposals in a referendum. The first time a bond had been turned down since 1924. And a public opinion poll found that three-fifths of the population disapproved of Sanford's performance as governor. In the 1962 elections the Democrats lost seats in the state House of Representatives. Though Sanford was disappointed, he remained convinced that the tax proposal was the best way to fund his program. Part 2 Gubernatorial Career Chapter 2 – North Carolina Fund and Anti-Poverty Measures Feeling that his education program had spent most of his political capital in the legislature, Sanford began seeking the support of the Ford Foundation to fund anti-poverty efforts. 
He eventually established the North Carolina Fund under the leadership of George S. to fight poverty and promote racial equality across the state. Part 2 – Gubernatorial Career Chapter 3 – Race Relations and Civil Rights In his inaugural address, Sanford appealed for mutual respect and understanding between races and said that no group of our citizens can be denied the right to participate in the opportunities of first-class citizenship. He enrolled his daughter Betsy and his son Terry in the integrated Murphy School. It was attended by a single black student. An action which received attention in the state and national press. In January 1964 James Farmer and Floyd McKissick of the Congress of Racial Equality demanded that the city of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, already one of the most integrated communities in the state, fully desegregate by February 1st or face a wave of demonstrations. Sanford released a statement of reproach towards the ultimatum and promised municipal officials his support. He later said, I felt that I had been pushed around long enough. Chapter 3 – Race Relations and Civil Rights Section 1 – Handling the Ku Klux Klan During Sanford's tenure, activities of the white supremacist Ku Klux Klan in North Carolina rapidly increased. Sanford requested information on the Klan from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. F by When the reports were found to be insufficient and unsatisfactory, he arranged for an undercover agent of the F by working in the North Carolina Division of Motor Vehicles to infiltrate the organization in the eastern portion of the state. Several months later the F by announced that North Carolina had one of the largest Klan membership in the country. In June 1964 an interracial group of students traveled to Elm City to renovate a local African-American church. Members of the United Clans of America confronted the youths, who promptly left the state. When a larger interracial group arrived to complete the work, 250 Klansmen marched into the town and two of them attempted to burn the church down. On June 22, Sanford issued a statement referring to anti-Klan legislation and saying, because there is a growing concern across the state, I think it is necessary to remind the people involved that the Ku Klux Klan is not going to take over North Carolina. Sanford condemned the Klan's methods and ordered the state highway patrol to assist the municipal police in protecting the church and maintaining order. His staff quietly brokered a compromise, convincing the local pastor to accommodate the white volunteers in a hotel instead of local black residents' homes thereby avoiding the racial mixing of which the Klansmen disapproved. State authorities dealt with members of the Klan in a similarly accommodating manner throughout the rest of Sanford's tenure, allowing the organization to strengthen its position in the region. In response to Sanford's criticism of their actions in Elm City, Klansmen burnt a cross on the lawn of the governor's mansion in mid-August. Sanford inspected the cross, later commenting, it is a badge of honor to have such hoodlums against you, but it is a mark of shame for the state of North Carolina to have such childish activities going on. In December when the Klan threatened businessmen who had sponsored interracial Christmas parades, he encouraged its members to read the Christmas story and the message of goodwill towards all men contained in the Bible and declared that if there are any illegal acts on the part of the Ku Klux Klan they will be prosecuted. Part 2 – Gubernatorial Career Chapter 4 – Relationship with John F. Kennedy Sanford was a close political ally of President John F. Kennedy, a fact that disturbed some North Carolina Democrats suspicious of Kennedy's Catholicism. According to Kennedy's personal secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, Sanford would have been Kennedy's choice for vice president on the 1964 Democratic ticket if Kennedy had lived. In her 1968 book Kennedy and Johnson she reported that Kennedy told her that Lyndon B. Johnson would be replaced as vice president. Lincoln wrote of that November the 19th, 1963, conversation just three days before Kennedy's assassination. Additionally, Sanford used his leverage with the White House to expand the Research Triangle Park. RTP Which sparked an economic surge in the state 
eventually luring IBM and the United States Environmental Protection Agency to the Triangle Area. Part 2 – Gubernatorial Career Chapter 5 – Other Positions Sanford was also a staunch opponent of capital punishment. His numerous statements against capital punishment were so well known that prisoners on North Carolina's death row pointedly referred to them in their clemency appeals. Part 3 – Return to Private Career After his term in office ended, Sanford opened a law firm. He had agreed to serve as Johnson's campaign manager in 1968 just before Johnson's withdrawal on March 31st. Sanford later took over as the campaign manager for the Democratic nominee Hubert Humphrey in his race against Republican Richard Nixon for the presidency. Johnson wanted Humphrey to pick Sanford as his running mate. On one occasion, the Humphrey campaign asked Sanford if he wanted to be the vice presidential candidate. Sanford declined, and Humphrey ultimately picked Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine. Though Sanford received a number of legal and business offers from the private sector during this period, he was interested in a position that would allow him to keep his political prospects open. Part 4 – President of Duke University In 1969, Sanford became President of Duke University, a position he held for the next 16 years. That helped quell student unrest over the Vietnam War early in his tenure as university president. Addressing the protests of the 1970 Kent State shootings with tolerance, choosing to not call in police to clear the roads, leading to the protesting students going back to their rooms at night so that West Campus could be reopened the next day kept the campus calm during a turbulent spring. Shortly before his tenure, on February 13, 1969, 60 student members of the Afro-American Society had occupied Duke's main administration center, the Allen Building, demanding the creation of a black studies program. After three days of clashes with police, they left the building peaceably February 16, when school officials agreed to the program. During his tenure, Sanford strongly opposed confrontation and a heavy police action which helped defuse racial tensions. Perhaps the greatest controversy of Sanford's presidency was his effort to establish the presidential library of former U.S. President Richard Nixon at Duke. Sanford raised the subject with Nixon during a visit to the former president at Nixon's New York City office on July 28, 1981. Sanford continued to seek Nixon's advice on multiple issues within the months that followed. The library proposal became public in mid-August, creating considerable controversy at the university. Though Sanford enjoyed some support for his effort, most of the faculty were against the proposal, the largest concern being that the facility would be a monument to Nixon rather than a center of study. Sanford tried to engineer a compromise. But the proposal by the Duke Academic Council of a library only a third the size of that which Nixon wanted and their rejection of a Nixon museum to accompany it, ultimately led Nixon to decline Sanford's offer and cite his library in the city of his birth, Yorba Linda, California, instead, it was dedicated there in 1990. Part 5 – Campaigns for the Democratic Presidential Nomination Though Sanford enjoyed his time as Duke's president, he still harbored political ambitions. As the 1972 presidential primary season began, he was approached by several people who felt that the field of Democratic candidates was weak. He was particularly keen to challenge Alabama Governor George Wallace in an effort to show that Wallace's segregationist views did not represent majority Southern opinion. Announcing his candidacy on March 8, he faced long odds in a crowded field. Knowing that he could not win a majority of delegates in the primary, he hoped to secure enough to emerge as a compromise candidate in a deadlocked convention. Even in the North Carolina primary, however, Wallace beat Sanford by 100,000 votes, and Sanford managed only a fifth-place finish at the 1972 Democratic National Convention with 77.5 votes, behind George McGovern.
1864.95 Henry M. Jackson 525 Wallace 381.7 and Shirley Chisholm 151.95 Undeterred, Sanford began preparations two years later for a run for the 1976 Democratic presidential nomination. Announcing his candidacy on June 1, 1975, he juggled campaign appearances with his obligations as president of Duke. While he developed a following among educators, he did not have a satisfactory campaign theme by the new year. Then, while campaigning in Massachusetts in January, he suffered sharp pains and was diagnosed with a heart murmur. On January 25, Sanford withdrew from the primaries, the first Democrat to do so that year. Part 6, Senate Career After retiring as president of Duke University in 1985, Sanford remained active in party politics. He made an unsuccessful run for chairman of the Democratic National Committee in 1985, in which he was supported by future House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Sanford lost to Paul G. Kirk by a vote of 203 to 150. After failing to find a Democrat willing to run for the Senate seat being vacated by Republican John P. East, Sanford announced his own candidacy for the nomination. His opponent was Congressman Jim Broyhill. After East committed suicide on June 29, 1986, Broyhill was temporarily appointed to the seat on July 3, until a special election could be held on November 4. Despite being attacked as a liberal, Sanford defeated Broyhill by three percentage points in the November election. Critics of Sanford primarily focused on three areas, his promotion of opportunities for minorities, tax and spend, education funding, and his anti-poverty campaign. He took office on November 5th, the day after the special election, to serve out the last two months of East's term and the subsequent six-year term. Sanford found his years in the Senate frustrating. He was concerned about the runaway deficit spending of the era, and he pursued economic development for Central America as an alternative to Republican-driven military policies. He led the Duke-based International Commission for Central American Recovery and Development, a task force of scholars and leaders that published Poverty, Conflict, and Hope, a turning point in Central America. Also known as the Sanford Commission Report since he was the principal catalyst of the Commission's work. In 1989 with the Principles for Promoting Peace, Democracy and Equitable Development in Central America. Sanford served on multiple Senate committees. Select Committee on Ethics. Chair. Special Committee on Aging, Budget, Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs including the Subcommittee on International Finance and Monetary Policy and Subcommittee on Securities, and Foreign Relations including Subcommittee on Near Eastern and South Asian Affairs. Chair. Subcommittee on African Affairs, and Subcommittee on Western Hemisphere and Peace Corps Affairs. He was a leading critic of American involvement in the Gulf War. He had a liberal voting record in comparison to his Democratic colleagues from the South, and he campaigned successfully against the passage of a constitutional amendment prohibiting flag burning with a counter-campaign promoting the United States Bill of Rights. Yet Sanford thought his accomplishments in the Senate paled against those he made as governor and he seriously contemplated retiring and pursuing other projects before deciding to run for re-election. His voting record was consistently more liberal than that of any of his predecessors, being given an American Conservative Union rating of 12%. Sanford's opponent in the 1992 election was Larch Faircloth, a former Democrat-turned-Republican who had served as state highway commissioner in Sanford's gubernatorial administration. Enjoying substantial backing from Sanford's Senate colleague, Jesse Helms, Faircloth accused Sanford of being a tax and spend liberal bound to special interests. While initial polls showed that Sanford had a comfortable lead over his rival, 
He lost supporters after an operation for an infected heart valve kept him from campaigning for much of October and raised doubts as to whether he was capable of serving another term. On November 3, 1992, Faircloth won the election by a 100,000 vote margin. Part 7. Later Life and Death Sanford wrote several books, including, But What About the People?, where he describes his efforts during the 1960s to establish a system of quality public education in North Carolina, Storm Over the States, where he lays forth a new groundwork for state government and the federal system by recommending a creative federalism, and outlive your enemies, grow old gracefully, where he describes actions that will slow the aging process and rules for prolonging healthy life. He also taught classes in law and political science at Duke University and campaigned for the construction of a major performing arts center in the Research Triangle area that would provide a permanent home for the American Dance Festival, the North Carolina Symphony and the Carolina Ballet. Sanford practiced law again in his later years and merged his own firm with that of another former governor, James Holshauser. Holshauser continued to practice with Sanford Holshauser LLP until his death. The firm continues under that name. And their economic development consulting firm continued under that name. The New York Times writer David Stout characterized Sanford as a contradictory politician and a man who lack. Edit. Burning Desire. Sanford announced in late December 1997 that he had been diagnosed with inoperable esophageal cancer and that his doctors said he had a few months to live. After his release from the hospital, his condition slowly deteriorated. He died in his sleep while surrounded by his family at his Durham home. He was 80 years old. At his funeral, he was eulogized by a childhood friend who said Sanford took the Boy Scout oath when he was 12 years old and kept it. It started out, on my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country, and included such things as help other people at all times. He believed it. He was the eternal Boy Scout. Sanford is entombed in the crypt of Duke University Chapel. Part 8, Legacy. Sanford was a major public figure of the post-World War II South. He played a key role in the transformation of Southern politics into the New South, primarily in the areas of race relations and education. In recognition of his efforts in education and in countless other areas, a 1981 Harvard University survey named him one of the 10 best governors of the 20th century. The Terry Sanford Federal Building and Courthouse in Raleigh, the state capital is named after Sanford. Sanford served as a role model to a number of Southern governors, including Jim Hunt of North Carolina. His protege, William Winter of Mississippi, and had Bill Clinton of Arkansas. Upon his death Clinton, who had since become President of the United States, said, his work and his influence literally changed the face and future of the South making him one of the most influential Americans of the last 50 years. John Edwards wrote that Sanford was his political hero. Duke University has since established an undergraduate and graduate school. Formerly Institute in Public Policy called the Sanford School of Public Policy. Fayetteville High School, in Fayetteville, North Carolina, was renamed Terry Sanford High School in his honor in 1968. Part 8, Legacy Chapter 1, Selected Books by Terry Sanford Postscript, Information about this video and recording This recording contained audio cues that marked punctuation that is ordinarily obscured to an audiobook listener. They were denoted as follows. And denotes left and right parentheses. Denotes normal, indented, and double indented bullet points. And denotes left and right square brackets.
This recording is a derivative work from Wikipedia. Speech is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution. Share alike 3.0. Unported license. All images and music were programmatically checked for a license compatible with Creative Commons Attribution. Share alike 3.0. Unported license. And all YouTube requirements for fair use. Specific licenses are detailed in the video. Authors of the respective article are given attribution in the video description. Request an article by Patreon or PayPal donation.